Each and every day over the past 11 months, Syrians have gathered in streets, squares, and neighborhoods to collectively raise their voices in a call for freedom, dignity, and justice, and an end to the tyranny and absolutist rule of the Assad regime. Their calls have been met with intimidation, violence, torture, and bombardment. Syria actually at the beginning, back in March 2011, they wanted changes and reforms. And from day one, they were saying, Silmiya, Silmiya, peaceful, peaceful. And the regime, the answer of the regime to this, instead of starting uh, real reforms, the regime went on arresting people, torturing teens in Dara, killing, shooting at people, sending choppers with uh, elite troops to Dara. Now, after 11 months in Syria, the situation is the following. There is no civil war in Syria currently, as we speak. But there is more and more sectarian violence. There are more and more voices within the population asking to have weapons to defend themselves and wage a war against the regime. Yes, there are people in Syria supporting the regime. We should not lie to ourselves. And in the gathering, a friend gathering yesterday, I was saying, my sister uh, is for the regime. I mean, the Syrian society now is split into people who are with and people who are against. The regime is pushing a whole one hard push to smash Homs, Idlib, and Dara at the same time. So expect more blood. The creation of the institutions of democracy, what happened? is that that relationship was reversed and kings and politicians became the small entities revolving around the will of the people and the people became the center. This is why we need to understand what's going on in Syria as part of a larger human context, as part of a larger human history in which people are gaining back their power. People were, absorb were absorbing all these values while they lived under tyranny. So what's going on now is a force of nature. It will not be stopped. But the first thing I want to propose is that violence has been a modality of government instituted by the Ba'athist regime from its inception and developed fully under uh, the al-Assad rule. So actually what we're seeing uh, now is not really uh, something that is new. One way to account for the centrality of violence in this context is to approach the Syrian regime as a version of what Michel Foucault, social philosopher and historian, uh, calls the racist state, which is also a murderous state in his terms and a suicidal state. Syrians knew that were they to oppose al-Assad rule, there would be mass killings, large-scale atrocities. The regime's willingness to quote-unquote sacrifice a large segment of the population was known. Long, local analysts and ordinary citizens only differed on the estimated number. The detention camp was not the margin of life in Syria, it was paradigmatic of the poverty. We think that 100,000 people, Syrian citizens, have gone through prison under Hafez of Assad. We realize how widespread the use of prisons have been. Uh, if you follow Syrian television, or you follow uh, pro-regime uh, loyalists when they're being interviewed on Al Jazeera or Al Arabi or any of that, uh, you will see the extent to which there is the loyalty of the president that justifies uh, any kind of uh, action. Uh, you would hear um, some of those figures who say uh, that uh, the protesters, the opposition, are traitors who deserve to be killed. If other dictators go into history as being those uh, who were the most brutal to citizens, I find that one of the uh, most appropriate labels, perhaps, for Bashar al-Assad is the killer of children. For the last 11 months, the Syrians have used non-violent means, mostly. 
But after 11 months of this level of brutality, there is a widespread level of frustration. It has been exasperated, especially of late, by the use of the veto right by the Chinese and the Russians, standing in the face of the entire world community. I heard many Syrians say that we feel we have become Palestinians. There's another nation on this planet that deals with that annually, every year, every year, every year. The entire world votes on something, and then the US vetoes that. What's going on is not just exposing the brutality of the Syrian regime, but it's also exposing the dictatorship and the despotic nature of our international world. What is happening in the Arab world is a response to that global structure. Enough is enough is not just to internal dictatorships, but also to the international structure of dictatorship. In fact, what's going on in the Arab world is a lot of, of the this, this, this symbolic power given and attributed to these figures of moral authority has been taken away from them. So it's not the politicians who have lost their moral stature, but it's also the religious leaders. And so the Syrian revolution, even though is standing at a very difficult moment, it has been able to achieve all that it has achieved because of the endurance and the sacrifice and the tremendous commitment of a people who have decided they will not accept to live under tyranny. When a crocodile wants to kill its prey, it drags it to the water. And th this is what, because that's where the crocodile is most powerful, in water. And what this regime has been doing is that it has been trying to trap the Syrian population into two or two ditches. The ditch of violence and the other ditch is sectarianism. Freedom is free. I know they're selling us water. Water is free and oxygen is free. And it is very unfortunate when, when people are given the impression that freedom has a price because it means then somebody can sell it and buy it. And freedom is non-negotiable. We need to make the Syrians believe that what they have done so far has not gone in vain and it has not gone to waste and that it has been the most tremendous revolution and it has been one of the most beautiful revolutions on the planet given also the tremendous brutality of the regime. We still have a lot to learn and what we've seen happening in the Arab world in the latest months is very impressive. Like we've demonstrated the fact that people can, when they're mobilized and when they're together, they can change things. Nonviolence has tried to wage political power with different means than violence. And the challenge is to say, okay, now people are being bombed. Now, if we try to go into to the history of nonviolence, where? Have we seen such situations of violence? And how did, we, did the people react? So what came up to my mind, obviously, is Gandhi. What was Gandhi doing in a situation of violence growing in India? He was using the fact that he had a very strong moral leadership in his community. And using that power to uh, convince population to stop violence. That would be the easy way, like transpose, transposing the situation of India to the, the situation in Syria. Within the Syrian diaspora around the world right now, can we identify six, seven, eight moral leaders? People that we know that each community would maybe follow. And can those people say, okay, then we'll go into an anger strike for 20 days until all violence stopped in the country? I'm not saying that I have the perfect recipe for what is happening in Syria. I'm just saying that nonviolence is trying to understand what is 
political power, Try, trying to understand what are the dynamics of political power in a society, and trying to find creative ways to switch the dynamic of power. 